974. Case is entitled State of North Dakota, XRL Wayne Stenzer, Attorney General Petitioner versus Jack Glazer. Glazer Images, LLC, respondents, matter set for a hearing. Today on an emergency application uh, for preservation and order to compel filed by the state. Uh, Mr. Card appears for the state, looks like uh, Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. O'Brien. Is that, do I have the parties correct or is, are the attorneys correct? Yeah, that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, okay. Tim O'Keefe and uh, Tatum O'Brien is in the room with me. Okay. And it looks like the respondent, Mr. Uh, Glazer, is on the uh, Zoom call today as well. The hearing is being conducted by Zoom. If you experience any difficulties with the uh, uh, Zoom uh, call, uh, please let me know. Are there any preliminary matters before we proceed today? Not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure that this is even a necessary hearing, Your Honor, but uh, we did file a response and uh, checked in with the clerk. I don't think they downloaded it to your system until this morning, so I apologize if it's... Okay. Yeah, I, I looked through most of it, at, at least this morning. I looked at your response and, and uh, I quickly went through the exhibits as well. Yeah, I, I looked yesterday, it wasn't in, and so I think it probably was just put in this morning. But, but I did get an opportunity to review the response, and I reviewed I know the uh, state had filed some supplemental uh, exhibits, uh, I think two days ago, and so I, I looked at those as well. Um, so I, I think I'm familiar at least with the, what's been filed and, and what the issues are, but uh, sounds like there hasn't been a, a resolution. So uh, Mr. Card, unless there, uh, there are any preliminary matters the state wishes to address, uh, it's uh, the state's motion and you, you may proceed. Right, the only thing I think preliminary I would note is just that we appreciate the court hearing this matter um, so quickly, but uh, maybe it makes sense to kind of summarize how we, how we got here. Um, First, uh, Glazer Images maintains or maintained a, a website at glazerimages.com. Um, that website is apparently gone. It's certainly not accessible to us. Um, as I'll note, and we can, I'll submit this as part of a, a reply brief, so I'm not referring to something outside the record, even though I understand the court doesn't have it yet. Um, but as part of the production that was made to us on November, November 8th included uh, what would seem to be or purport to be the Glazer Images website. However, it really is just screenshots out of a web builder program. So our preview is not the actual website. So I'm just noting that that's one item, um, the website that it, it appears to be spoliated. Um, it was reported in the media that the Facebook page for Glazer Images had quote unquote disappeared. Um, there's been some form of production of that to us, but um, we're having some issues with uh, the production as, as made to us. And we reached out actually to uh, Mr. O'Keefe and O'Brien um, regarding that, but they didn't return our call yesterday. Um, so we haven't fully reviewed whether or not the Facebook page has been produced in a manner that's acceptable, but I'll note that again, there's a spoliation issue if the media has been reporting that it has disappeared. But maybe more significantly um, is what we learned on October 28th, when Sierra Hall, the uh, former accountant of Glosser Images, testified to the fact that she had a number of emails in her Glosser Images email account that were missing from the inbox between when she ac accessed it on approximately October 7th and when she accessed it on October 27th. Um, and I'll, on that point, I'll note that uh, Mr. Glosser in his affidavit essentially admits to spoliating those those emails or spoliating that that email account. Um, spoliation, while certainly the most egregiously would be the deletion of say those emails, but alteration itself is is spoliation and, and that's just a basic definition of spoliation coming from, for example, Black Laws Dictionary. Um, so I, I think that's ad admitted as far as we're concerned and we don't have those emails. Mr. Glazer's affidavit um, does not say, does not specifically address those, those emails. So it's all very vague um, in his affidavit regarding whether those emails still exist. And again, we can't say today whether they've been produced or not. As far as we're concerned, it, you know, they have not been. And again, I think that Mr. Glazer's affidavit corresponds nicely with Ms. Hall's testimony that those emails are gone from her inbox and that 
that's an alteration of that email account, which by itself constitutes spoliation. And then finally, what really uh, got the ball rolling was the email we received from Ms. O'Brien regarding Glosser Images entries or web pages on the websites, the Wedding Wire and the Knot, uh, which are hosted by uh, Wedding Pro. Um, just some choice quotes. I mean, Ms. O'Brien said that those pages would be quote unquote automatically closed in the near future. She referenced prior to the date for their compliance with our subpoena, which was November 8th. Um, and then attached to her email was a, a number of exchanges between Mr. Glaser and representatives of Wedding Pro, where again, some choice quotes include, there is no saving the information um, that if he ceases paying for his subscription, um, that he would lose access to his account and the storefront, storefronts are removed entirely and there is no more content or reviews. And on that subject, I'll note that what it's in a specific format, which I won't get into here, but some in some form, those web pages have been produced to us. However, I'll note that in the exchange between Mr. Glaser and Wedding Pro, he references messages, he references reviews, and he references other data. The essentially the, a web page being produced to us is not all of that information. So the messages that Mr. Glaser admits to existing when he communicates with Wedding Pro have not been produced. So merely producing uh, a, a, a web page that's been saved in some fashion is not producing all of the contents of that website. And that's the same thing with glaserimages.com. There is a lot of information that's in the background of a web page that is not immediately available just by going to the website. So for example, we can't see who accessed the site. We can't see how many consumers visited the site. We can't see who edited the site. So there's all important information that we need that thus far has not been produced. And if it's foliated, if any of that is foliated, we will never get access to. And that's significant because a later sanction, like a, a motion for sanctions for spoliation in actual litigation, in our view, would not be satisfactory to remedy the, the possible harm. And particularly right now where the court by issuing an order to preserve essentially prevents that from happening. And that's maybe the uh, most important thing is that there's a duty to preserve evidence when litigation is reasonably foreseeable. That's repeated several times in North Dakota case law. So really the, if the court grants this, this application and orders them, the respondents to preserve evidence, the court isn't really doing anything beyond, you know, requiring respondents to do what they're already obligated to do. Um, as far as, so that's, that's kind of what, th those are the main issues thus far that we've, that we're aware of with regard to spoliation. Um, and then how we really arrived here is, you know, we attempted, and I think the court already acknowledged that we were unable to resolve this without applying to the court. And that's despite our best efforts. I, I think that the court, since we filed the email exchanges, can, can really see, you know, what efforts we made. I mean, on October, or excuse me, October 20th, which is index number 10, we sent a letter advising respondents of their obligation to preserve evidence. And in response, we got objections to the term website and maintain, which, I mean, I, I, I don't think have much merit given the fact that you know, words that aren't technical in nature or not defined are supposed to be given their ordinary meaning. But that's the response we received. It wasn't a, you know, oh, we're, we're going to preserve all this and we're going to pro provide it to you. It was objections. Essentially, I mean, I interpret it as covering for potential spoliation. Um, and then when we sent an email on October 22nd asking for respondents to state their position with regard to preservation and production, uh, Ms. O'Brien responded, and I certainly acknowledge that she said court intervention isn't necessary. However, she didn't directly answer the state's question. And then the state sent a, se a second email and asked again, will you please just directly answer the question as to whether or not your clients will preserve evidence and then produce it? And that email was ignored. Um, 
And regarding, you know, the, the statement that court intervention isn't necessary, I, I note that while this is not a, uh, a formal discovery matter, it's certainly not pursuant to Rule 37 and, and, the, and the other discovery rules, it's certainly analogous in some respects. So if this was a Rule 37 meet and confer and someone said, oh, hey, you haven't produced documents to us under this specific rule or even answer this interrogatory, and a party reached out and said, will you please provide this information to us, or we might have to go to the court on a motion to compel under Rule 37, and the other party simply responds, court intervention isn't necessary. That, that, that doesn't directly answer the question about whether or not they are going to provide the information. Here, it's a little bit different because, of course, what the real issue is, is whether evidence is going to be preserved when there are at least four instances thus far indicating that there is spoliation occurring or potential spoliation occurring. So it's a little bit different, even though I think it's, it's analogous. Um, and so, of course, again, we have is a, I'm uh, oh, sorry, and then on a, uh, in the subsequent email, we offered to uh, resolve this matter before it was heard by the court by stipulation, and that also was not responded to. So that's really how we got here. I, I think that as much as the respondents contend, and maybe Mr. O'Keefe just said it, that you know this doesn't need to be here. I mean, I think that, I think that it does, where there are several instances of spoliation or potential spoliation, and they, they, we would never have brought the matter to the court if the respondents had simply responded to our email or letter that they will preserve all evidence and produce it to us. But I think, again, I think the court can read the emails just as easily as we can, that fairly reading them, that, 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 that we did not get a response. And regarding specifically preservation, I cited to a, uh, a federal case, uh, the Pueblo of Laguna versus United States, just because that's a case that very clearly states that courts have an inherent authority to preserve evidence. I think that it can be inferred um, in North Dakota case law as well. There's a line of North Dakota cases dealing with the court's ability, including under its inherent authority to sanction for spoliation. I think that if the court has the inherent authority to issue sanctions for spoliation, it certainly has the inherent authority to order preservation. Um, and th th that line of cases is Bachmeyer versus Wallworks one and two, and then Fines versus Wrestler Enterprises. And then finally, Ely versus Lazaretto. Um, but aside from the court's inherent authority, I, I think the court can very clearly issue this order under uh, 5115.06. That allows the court and allows the attorney general to seek an order of the court where a party fails or refuses to comply with an attorney general subpoena. Um, and we're, we're in that scenario now. Um, both with regard to respondents' refusal to indicate whether they would preserve and produce evidence. But then even in uh, the, the briefing that's been submitted, respondents admit that they have not complied with the subpoena. Uh, I think it's in paragraph three that they state that they know their production is incomplete. And that's significant okay. because one, it's, it's a failure. So therefore I think we can invoke 51.15.06. But not only that, I'll just highlight that what was your there favorite was, part about the trip? Thank you. I'll just highlight that there, there was no there was no agreement that their response was, excuse me, they, they never reached out for, never requested, and were never granted an extension. They just have, on their own, decided to, to produce something that's, make an incomplete production. And again, I'll analogize to, uh, discovery rules, even though, again, this is not covered under the discovery rules. Um, the Supreme Court has said multiple times, um, I think most recently in Barth v. Barth, but certainly it's consistent in, in North Dakota uh, precedent that a party is not at liberty to pick and choose what they'll produce. They're required to completely and timely produce discovery. Um, and by respondents admittedly not fully complying with the subpoenas of the state on time, um, they're not in compliance with that 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 general requirement of litigants. So therefore, we're in a situation where the court can grant such other relief as required, and that includes, in this case, ordering the respondents to fully comply with the state subpoenas, 
and then also um, require that they preserve all evidence that's relevant to this matter. I, we would be in a severely disadvantaged state if we get to litigation and have to seek sanctions later. Um, and specific to enforcement of our subpoenas, the North Dakota Supreme Court has said that there are four factors that must be considered. Those are whether or not the subpoenas within the statutory authority of the agency, whether the information sought is reasonably relevant to the inquiry of the proceeding, um, if the subpoena is reasonably specific, and if the subpoena is not unduly broad or burdensome. And on that point, I'll just note, because respondents make reference in their brief that you know, the, the subpoena seeks a lot of information. But whether or not a subpoena or discovery request seeks a lot of information is not really the test for whether or not a uh, request is broad. It's for example, overbroad might be if a party is seeking discovery that is more appropriate from a third party, or if it's not clear what's being requested. And there's certainly no argument that respondents have made in their briefing that that's the case. So when those four factors are met, which they are, and again, respondents have made no argument um, that, that those factors are not met, and if they do so at this hearing, it would be raised for the first time, which I think would disadvantage us or prejudice our ability to argue this now. Um, I, I think that this, that this court can enforce the subpoena on that basis. And then finally, I suppose I'll note um, that in their briefing, respondents do not argue that they don't have a duty to preserve evidence. They don't argue that they're not obligated to comply with the state subpoenas. It really seems to boil down to they, that they think that we were premature. But uh, and again, I think I've hopefully explain well enough that where we couldn't reach an agreement, I don't think it's premature, where there's at least four instances of spoliation or potential spoliation, I, I don't think we jumped the gun, particularly again, where we could not get resolution from respondents despite repeated efforts to do so. Um, the, the, the final thing I'll note is that respondents make a request for attorney's fees under Rule 37. This the state's application is not, again, it's, it's, it's a pre-litigation subpoena enforcement. It's, this is a pre-litigation law enforcement subpoena. It is not a discovery request pursuant to rules 30, 30, excuse me, 30, 31, 33, or 34. We're not invoking rule 37 and we're not, so we're not motioning to compel under rule 37. So there's no basis for the respondents to request attorney's fees under rule 37. Instead, this has been brought pursuant to North Dakota Century Code 5115.06, and part of chapter 5115 includes 5115.10. That allows or really requires that the state be given its attorney's fees for any proceeding brought pursuant to chapter 5115, which this brought pursuant to 5115.06 is. And the state will submit a statement after this hearing um, because it does request its attorney's fees. And while we think the statute quite clearly requires that, that we be awarded our attorney's fees, certainly I, I think it's appropriate here where we attempted repeatedly to get some sort of agreement with the respondents and, 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 they, and they just didn't make any effort as far as we're concerned. And, and, I, and I say that because of them ignoring multiple efforts to communicate. So we would ask that the uh, court order them to preserve, order the response to preserve evidence, and we would ask that the court order them to comply with our subpoenas. Um, that's all I have for now. I, if I have any time based upon how long was scheduled for this hearing, maybe I would appreciate an opportunity to respond to uh, the respondents' arguments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Card. Mr. O'Keefe? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'll start with this. On behalf of Glaser Images and Mr. Glaser, uh, and acting as his attorneys, uh, to the best of our ability, we will preserve all evidence and provide it to the Attorney General's office. That's what Mr. Card said he wanted to hear from us. So I'm using his words to tell you that we will do that, number one. Number two, we are the ones that reached out to the Attorney General's office as early as October 13th. It was actually prior to that, October 11th, I believe, but they didn't respond to my October 11th email. So didn't have a chance to talk to them then. On October 13th, I believe it was, and I, I think that email 
is in, uh, we, we filed it late as exhibit D to my affidavit. We asked if it was too premature to get together uh, to talk about this situation and everything involved. They agreed to do that. What Mr. Card has failed to mention in picking apart the things that suit him best is that on October 18th, Ms. O'Brien and I had a phone conversation with Mr. Grossman and Mr. Card. I'm not sure who else from their office. I'm sure they recorded it and could provide it to the court. But in that conversation, we tried to bring to light some of these issues. And what we tried to bring to light is that there are websites, if using their words again, uh, that are controlled by third parties, that Mr. Glaser and Glaser Images did not have control over what happens ultimately to that data. Uh, Mr. Card used the word metadata. Um, we, we tried to tell them, you know, look, we don't know. We just got involved. We were just contacted within days, almost hours of reaching out to them. Uh, we don't know what's there as the attorneys, but we will work with Glaser Images and Mr. Glaser to preserve all this evidence and turn it over. We don't know what form it's in. They wanted certain formatting of information. They were asking to use a Again, Mr. Card's definition of spoliation, they were asking us to provide it in a, in a form that it was not already in. So I guess they were asking us to spoliate so then they could use it against us later. It doesn't make sense, Your Honor. They brought this motion prior to our time to have our clients' responses to the subpoenas provided to them, which was November 8th deadline. There's a November 23rd examination under oath of Mr. Glaser that's scheduled. We informed them, I believe in that call, um, at least some point we informed them that we will comply with the subpoena in a timely fashion. There's a lot of information. We know there are lots of emails. I mean, they asked for everything. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of emails. Those have, you know, those have to be provided. We agree. They will be provided if they haven't already. And, and we've done our best to get all that information to the attorney general's office. The, the website, the Facebook page, the Instagram page were shut down because Mr. Glaser was being bombarded by clients um, some with very respectful requests and, and in inquiries into what is going to happen. There was a lot of misinformation being floated out uh, to the public that photos and videos of weddings were being destroyed. That's not the case. Those are all preserved as well. Mr. Glaser was forced uh, to, to stop these things to, the, and shut that down from the standpoint of he was receiving threats. He received a death threat. Uh, the attorney general's office can in, make an inquiry with the Mandan Police Department about the threats that Mr. Glaser received. Okay, so there was no destruction of anything. There was no hiding of anything. It's all still there. Our phone call initially with the attorney general was to say, look, we're involved now. And if we're not involved, I don't know how you're going to get all this stuff. We need to work with Mr. Glaser to provide it to you. When Ms. O'Brien, who is here, uh, emailed with Mr. Card, it was again in a step to say, look, the Wedding Pro website is not under our control. That's a third party again. We're working with them to preserve that evidence. We provided, uh, just to deviate for a second, uh, we provided, or through Glaser, provided to companies like Wedding Pro, to Slack. Um, I can't remember the other ones. We provided copies of the subpoena to Glaser Images and Jack Glaser. Uh, we provided them those subpoenas to tell them, look, you need to preserve this on your end and help us retrieve it. And so I think we filed an email 
last night, uh, showing that we finally um, got through with Wedding Pro and we're able to transfer that information to Glauser so it can be given to the Attorney General's office. My point being is we've tried to work with the Attorney General's office, but they didn't seem interested in working with us. They would, they, they were saying, well, hey, we'll listen to you, but you need to provide it. We said we would provide it. Um, this was in October. And then on late October 22nd, on a Friday, you know, another email comes to our office. I can tell you, I was in a, a three to four hour board meeting that day with another organization. Uh, Ms. O'Brien had a family wedding. You know, that's a Friday afternoon. I'm sorry, Your Honor, we didn't get to the, the Attorney General's office by the end of the day that day. Uh, it's not an excuse, it's just reality that the, again, responses to the subpoena were not due until November 8th, okay? Mr. Glaser has been working day and night to put this information together, along with trying to respond to a lot of other things. So to say that uh, he was spoliating by trying to, to get the, the emails into a format to turn over to the office pursuant to the subpoena is absolutely absurd. They brought in, um, I can't remember her last name. I apologize to, to her, uh, Sierra was her first name. Uh, we, we didn't know they were examining her. Uh, we didn't know what it was about until they filed the, the supplemental affidavit over the weekend. Well, what happened, Your Honor, is that, um, you know, I guess we don't know what happened. We don't know what was asked of her, but Glaser Images was shut down on October 8th. Uh, the employees were let go. This individual, um, apparently on October 27th, without authorization, uh, logged into the email account for Glaser Images looking for information. Now, we don't know what she did when she went into that account. I mean, we could make a, a false allegation that she did something to that account. We don't have that evidence and I'm not making that allegation. I'm not going to jump to a conclusion like Mr. Card did in that statement. What we're trying to do is get this information to the attorney general's office. And that's exactly what was done. Mr. Glaser organized it into folders so that it would be there and viewable. The, uh, the fact of the matter is, Your Honor, that this motion was extremely premature for two reasons. One, we were not given adequate time to work with our client, to get this information to the Attorney General's office prior to, to this being filed and then responding to this as well. Number two, the subpoena alone is a preservation order. The subpoena alone is asking us to provide this information. We did object that there was overbroad nature to the requests. One of the things that we tried to, to decipher is, well, what do you mean by websites? I mean, there is only one Glaser Images website and one website that he controls. That's still available. As to these other websites, quote unquote, uh, they're controlled by third parties, yet we've been working with these third parties to get that information into a format that can go to the Attorney General's office. If we use Mr. Card's analysis, it would be like telling us that by printing off every email onto a piece of paper and turning it over, we altered the email and it's spoliated. It's insane. It's absolutely ridiculous. Your Honor, Mr. Glaser had to shut down his business. That was, a, that was a travesty. After 16 years, the, the finances were no longer there to continue operations. He had to shut down, let a lot of people go, and was left with a lot of photos and videos that were unedited and need to be distributed. There's hardly time in the day to get that accomplished 
to try to help the, the consumer that this attorney general's office is supposed to be protecting. Yet Mr. Glaser has worked night and day to try to find a way to do both things, return all this, the photos or get distribute the photos and videos to these wedding parties, while at the same time spending night and day trying to respond to the subpoena. So to, to burden us with this motion, whether it's under 5115 or whether it's a rule 37 discovery request, which is hard to decipher because it seems like they're, they're looking for both and whatever will suit them best. They are not entitled to in attorney's fees. We're, we're not, you know, we didn't respond to say that they don't have the right to have us preserve this evidence, that they don't have the right to have this information. Quite the contrary. Again, it was our office that reached out to the attorney general and to talk about some of these specific issues. There were other things as well, but by no means is Mr. Glaser or Glaser Images refusing to preserve evidence or refusing to turn it over. So there, there should be no attorney's fees. Um, quite frankly, they're, they're, I don't see how they're, they're allowed when they're asking the court to just rubber, to, to just stamp what they've already served us and say, yes, the court agrees this is a legitimate subpoena, they should preserve the evidence and turn it over. We already know that, we're officers of the court. We got involved, um, I believe it was October 8th or 9th. And what, one of the first conversations we would have with any client like Mr. Glaser is don't destroy anything, keep everything intact. What do you have for computers? Where are they located? Um, the landlord to the office went and changed the lock so that former employees couldn't get in to destroy anything. We took numerous proactive measures to make sure that everything was preserved because Glaser Images and Jack Glaser have nothing to hide. There's no reason to destroy anything. Um, if the attorney general's office would like to take possession of all of these computers with all of these photos and all the emails, by all means, we'll, we'll deliver them to their office and then they can have at it. What Mr. Glaser is trying to do is, is extract the information to give it to the attorney general's office. We're trying to assist in that, while at the same time trying to preserve all of the photos and videos that are truly the underlying subject matter of this case. And I can see from my, my screen that there are a lot of people here interested in a motion to compel hearing. Um, that, that doesn't happen in the normal case. So there are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of things that are happening. But again, to quote Mr. Card, and I'll put them as my own quote as well. Your Honor, we can assure the court that we have tried to work with the Attorney General's office. We will preserve the evidence the affamous for Glaser, he has been directed by his attorneys to do so. We will provide the evidence to the attorney general's office. We will produce Mr. Glaser for an examination on November 23rd. I don't know what more we can do. And the fact that we've had to spend time responding to this and to, to argue about something that we're already doing is why we're requesting attorney's fees whether I sought them inappropriately under rule 37, my bad, I apologize. But I don't see under rule 50 or statute 5106 or 511506, I believe it is, where that reciprocates so we can receive them. You know, we can only do so much and say so many things and try to be helpful. Um, but as an officer of the court, uh, myself and on behalf of Ms. O'Brien, we have done everything in our ability to convey to our client that you have to preserve this and you have to turn it over. And there's absolutely no reason not to do that. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you for your time. Mr. Card, any uh, reply? Yes, thank you. I'll- Any, 
I understand you, you wanted to issue a, a, submit a, a reply brief as well. And, and just so a record is clear, uh, it was an emergency hearing uh, motion so we, or application. So we tried to set the hearing as soon as we can. We, we gave uh, the respondent 14 days, but set the hearing on the 15th day. Under the rules, uh, the, the uh, petitioner would have, have an additional five days to submit the reply brief. But, um, and again, I just got the, uh, the uh, responses came in today. I didn't have a lot of time to, to look at them. They were timely filed. I'm, I'm not saying that. It's just that I haven't had a lot of time to look at them. So uh, we tried to get the hearing set as soon as we can. Uh, so I appreciate both of you uh, being prepared to argue today. Um, but Mr. Card, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, on the subject of the reply brief, I'll just note, I, I already have something put together. Um, you probably could have filed it before the hearing, but I wanted to wait until Mr. O'Keefe's filing was on the record so I could s specifically cite to the the, the record um, as opposed to just the brief. So I have it ready to go. I could probably file it shortly after this hearing. Um, uh, so just a couple of things. Um, I don't think that Mr. O'Keefe is fairly characterizing the conversation that we had um, following his his email, that is to say that the main main thrust that I recall from that conversation was just that Miss O'Brien said that we could not request documents in I think it was single file, TIFF and JPEG format. Um, but really, the the request I, I think was misread by Miss O'Brien. In any case, it's requested in a native format or in cases where that wouldn't be appropriate, which may be some social media postings, for example, it should be supplied in, 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 in as a picture, like a JPEG or a TIFF file. So uh, to uh, Mr. O'Keefe's point that somehow we're requesting them to alter documents so that we can come to the court and complain about spoliation, I, I think that's unfair where it's native or in these picture formats. Um, and then secondarily, at no point during this conversation that we had with Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. O'Brien did we discuss the Glaser Images website or the Glaser Images Facebook page or the emails of Sierra Hall that, that get gone missing or the uh, the Wedding Pro website. So none of those were discussed. So therefore, none of those. It's not like as if I hid the ball from the court. We had a discussion about these with Mr. Ms. Tatum and, and Mr. O, Mr. O'Keefe, and then came to the court and withheld that from the court. The, this the ball really got rolling when we received Miss O'Brien's email. We were already aware from media reports and our own, you know, attempts to investigate here in our office that there were other issues with regard to spoliation. It just came to a head when we received Miss O'Brien's email, and then again when when we took Miss Hall's testimony and found out that she had missing email. So I, I just want the, the court to be aware of that. Um, Mr. O'Keefe says that the final one of the final things he said was that he agrees that they'll produce all of what's required to be produced and that they will preserve evidence. That sounds to me like they agree that in order to preserve, in order to in order to be compelled to comply with the subpoena is appropriate. I think they've essentially conceded the grounds and the relief that we're seeking. And I, I think on the basis alone, the the, the court could grant our application. And I and again, I think it, the court should, under the circumstances where the respondent's briefing admits that they have not fully complied by November 8th, notwithstanding the fact that they never reached out for an extension and were never granted an extension. They just simply on their own decided not to complete their production on November 8th. And then secondarily, when there are a number of re reportings and information that we have, we brought to the court of spoliation or potential spoliation. I, I, again, I, I, if, if respondents had simply communicated with us that they would preserve and produce information to us, we would never have come to the court. And I, while I appreciate Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. O'Brien may have been busy Friday afternoon, that Friday afternoon we emailed them on October 22nd, I, I frankly don't think that explains why they didn't respond to us between October 22nd and yesterday. Uh, I mean, it that wasn't does. as if that was... Uh, I'll give you an opportunity to uh, respond. Sure. So it, it's not as if we were expected a, an immediate turnaround. Um, we didn't bring the, the application until October 26th. And, and then again, after the application was brought, we offered for just to resolve this without a hearing, just by stipulation. But they didn't respond to that either. So 
a busy Friday afternoon, I don't think is really an excuse when we made other efforts to obtain their stipulation or agreement that would not have necessitated this hearing and, and this application itself. Um, one, one thing I missed, he, Mr. O'Keefe said two things were taken down. I missed the first one, um, but he said that Instagram was shut down because of essentially what were harassing messages. Um, again, that, that would be another admission of spoliation. If the Instagram page was shut down, that is not preservation and that represents spoliation. So I would just add that as a fifth incident of spoliation that makes it necessary for the court to issue in order to preserve. And, and yes, we have our subpoena orders preservation, but that, that, that thus far is clearly not happening if, if we have multiple admissions and testimony under oath that, that evidence has gone missing. So it, it, it's, it doesn't seem to be enough that we've already ordered the preservation and that that's not happening. The, uh, I guess the final point that I want to make is uh, Mr. O'Keefe's multiple references to the fact that, for example, Wedding Pro, uh, the, the Wedding Pro website, having the, the two web pages that correspond to Glosser, that those are controlled by third parties. I, I certainly recognize that Wedding Pro is its own entity. However, the web pages of Glosser images that are on Wedding Pro are in Glosser's possession, custody, or control. Um, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll analogize with uh, Discovery Legal Authority that says that you know courts have universally held that documents are deemed to be within the possession, custody, or control if the party has actual possession, custody, or control, or has the legal right to obtain the documents on demand. Um, that case is Tomlinson versus El Paso Corp. 245 FRD at page 476. Um, they go on to say the control comprehends not only possession, but also the right authority or ability to obtain the documents. And that that's the case here. Um, it, so Mr. Glaser in those emails that we've put in the record requested to be supplied with the, all the reviews, messages, and other data that are contained on his pages on the Wedding Pro websites. And they responded, a Wedding Pro representative responded that they have the ability to quote, log in and export their lead details for both storefronts now. And in another email, a Wedding Pro representative offered to help them obtain the documents. The point being that if they have the ability to download that information now, that means that it is in, was within his possession, custody or control, it doesn't matter that it's held by a third party. I mean, there are other records that are in someone's possession, custody or control that are held by a third party. For example, bank records. Someone has the legal right to their, their bank records, even if it's held at the bank. So it's not any different here with regard to these websites on the, the Wedding Pro webpage. So I, I feel like to the extent that the respondents emphasize this third party um, holding documents relevant to this matter, it, it's not enough that to take it out of respondent's responsibility. So I, I, I think that, that I will conclude my argument there and I appreciate the court hearing us out. Okay. Thank you. Mr. O'Keefe, I'll give you a, a brief opportunity to briefly respond. And, and uh, I, I am going to, before I, you do that, I'm just going to let you know, I am going to take Senator advisement so I have an opportunity to, to review the, the documents and the response that was filed. Uh, by the respondents that uh, was just put into Odyssey this morning shortly before the hearing and also to give Mr. Card an opportunity to uh, submit his reply brief. Um, I, I did have one question, I guess, and, and maybe you answered it. I know that uh, respondents indicated they would preserve all evidence and provide, uh, respond to the request and provide what was requested. Um, and then I, I also understand that you, uh, you've reached out to some of these third party uh, vendors or, or websites that, that uh, uh, Glaser Images was using, and then you've gotten a response from, from Wedding Pro that they they can uh, uh, produce the, uh, the Glaser Images information that's been requested. Uh, what I, I, it's not clear to me is that it's my understanding, not only that they can produce it or these other third parties can produce it, but I, I think what I understand one of the state's concerns to be is that uh, there's an agreement or a contract uh, with these websites that you have to pay to keep them active. And if that, that expires, then they're shut down. And 
either the information is not is gone or it's uh, at least more difficult to uh, to uh, obtain. And so, uh, Mr. O'Keefe, are there any websites like that that uh, it's not only producing what you have, but the obligation to keep those open so that that information uh, is available? No, to my knowledge, Your Honor, I, I can't answer that question with 100% certainty in, in my own knowledge of, of what's out there. But from what I do know, the, um, the, wet, the Wedding Pro um, Slack was another one. We reached out, provided the subpoenas. They are pay to place sites. Um, they both have indicated, hey, no problem. We understand. We'll keep it open. Um, Ms. O'Brien pointed out to me, I, I was inarticulate in, in my choice of words, but the things like the social media sites, which I do not believe you have to pay for, um, they, were, they were not erased or deleted or destroyed or whatever spoliated. Um, they were they were just made inactive to to stop the direct messages from coming in from the public that were threatening in nature or whatever in nature they um, so inactive would be the word for those websites not that they were taken down um, and I, and I'm using the word websites which I think is is not correct either but that's what the attorney general's office used so my point being that from Day one, we've tried to communicate this to the attorney general's office, including those two websites that we're worried about, that if, you know, hey, they're still active, uh, they've been paid for through the month, here's the link here, you know, here's what you can do. Um, but clearly, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't enough for them. They had this motion ready to go, uh, 227 on a Friday, they send us an email and then um, before we respond, they file a motion. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of things here, Your Honor, but at no time, I just, I, I just can't stress it enough that at no time did we indicate to them that we wouldn't preserve things, we wouldn't turn it over. We were more concerned, again, about the format. Well, that was, you know, to Mr. Card's point, there were a lot of things discussed in the call, but the one thing that he and Ms. O'Brien talked about was the format of emails or, you know, if, if they want them in the native form, then that's how they're getting them. That's how they received them on Monday when we, we turned things over. Um, I, don't, I don't know what more we can do. And I don't, I still don't understand why the court needed to be involved so early. Um, again, the, a, an order would just rubber stamp what, what, we understand has already been done, a request to preserve and turn over information. So um, to, I hope I answer your question. I, I, I don't know if there are other pay sites I'd have to, to look at, at uh, the information, talk to, to our client again to see if there are other uh, pay sites um, that we need to deal with. But I think we've done a, a thorough job of getting to everybody and, and getting all that information already. Okay. Okay, anything else? No, thank you for the time you're on. Okay, again, I'm gonna take this under advisement so I have an opportunity to review the response and, and give the state an opportunity to submit its reply. Um, I, I don't know that issuing the order, as Mr. O'Keefe said, really adds anything to their obligation already to uh, legal obligation to preserve it evidence and to produce under the subpoena, but um, I'm not sure that it hurts anything either and might be, be appropriate in this case, uh, just to make that clear. But um, and then I guess we have the issue of attorney's fees I'll look at as well. I'm not uh, all that familiar with the uh, attorney's fees uh, issue under uh, Chapter 51. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a look at that as well. But I'll take this under advisement after I, I get the reply brief. I'll, I'll uh, review uh, this again and issue a ruling as soon as I can. I know there's a lot of uh, interest in this by the number of people that on this call, as you indicated, uh, Mr. O'Keefe, we typically don't have a lot of people that attend uh, um, applications uh, or orders such as this or motions that hearings such as this, but um, obviously this case has generated a lot of interest and uh, that's evident by the uh, participation in the Zoom call today. So uh, again, I'll take it under advisement. I'll issue a ruling as soon as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.